I have been waiting almost 12 years for a sequel to Dragon's Dogma, and finally we are a couple days away from the official release. Finally, I'm going to have the opportunity to play through the entirety of the game and share my thoughts on what I love about it. And so that's exactly what this video is going to be. Capcom provided me with a code to play the game early in order to create a review, but that came with a few caveats. For one, I received the code about 10 days out from release and about a week from embargo. That's not a lot of time time to get through a game like Dragon's Dogma 2 when you want to see and experience everything, especially at your own pace. Plus, if I want to continue playing the game publicly, I have to start on a fresh save to make sure that I'm not streaming endgame material early for newer players. That's understandable. If there was ever a game that I believe you should go into as blindly as possible, it's one like this. For that reason, this video is just going to be an initial review on what I managed to experience with the time I had at the pace I felt comfortable with, which will include minimal but still very present spoilers. If your question is, should I spend my money on this game, then stick around and maybe my experience will help you find your answer. A while back I did a short review for Starfield because they had me on a similar time constraint. Not to throw shade, but Dragon's Dogma deserves more than that. It doesn't deserve a review that feels rushed. Even so, I also understand the importance of releasing something like this early, giving you a quick look at what is on offer and helping you decide if it's worthwhile. So that's why my initial impressions here are only the beginning. When the game is out, I plan on playing all the way through, live streaming as much as I can, and using the full experience to write a more detailed review and analysis down the line. I love Dragon's Dogma, from when I randomly found it during a workday at a future shop in Canada, to now, having played through Dark Arisen countless times and even experiencing a brand new sequel I once thought would only exist in my dreams. To me, the original was one of the best games ever made, and if the sequel could even capture a fraction of that, it'd at least be worth experiencing. The feeling of dread when a random chimera approaches you out of nowhere, the oddities of the characters that lead towards the uncanny, and a plot that goes from straightforward to absurd. Two would already be a contender for game of the year in my eyes, but if it could go further than that, improve on everything from the original and add additional content to keep it fresh, then this game has the opportunity of being one of the best I've ever played. A game I'll play through periodically over and over again, similar to games from my past, games like New Vegas, Knights of the Old Republic, Oblivion, and more. For me, it feels like history in the making because Dragon's Dogma has just been that good. A diamond in the rough, a niche experience that has earned the right to become more visible in the public eye. If you enjoy this type of content, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing. Additionally, consider this your minor spoiler warning for some of the early storyline and mechanics that exist within the game. Plus, potentially major spoilers for the original, I don't know. I don't know yet. With that out of the way, I'm Super Rad, and this is Dragon's Dogma 2, an initial review. To start things off, I have bad news guys, there is no J-Rock Anthem fated to be lost to licensing issues years later attached to the title screen in this game. For those not in the know, one of the best tracks of all time used to be played on the opening screen of Dragon's Dogma and was later replaced in Dark Arisen. We were robbed. Nothing short of a crime. This time we're met with a bird's eye view of Vernworth, the capital city of Vermont. A means of showing the city's life and what is to be expected in the game, and a view that will shift to Batal later on. You'll have the choice to jump right into the character creator or simply use a preset character instead but you'd be doing yourself a disservice to skip it in my opinion. Capcom continues to iterate on their character creation process within the RE engine with each game that comes out, and it gets better and better each time. We now have a creator so detailed and precise that people are making one-to-one -one lookalikes of every famous person you have ever thought of, or they are making the most hideous flesh demons you've ever seen. It's so good here that I'm even more excited just to imagine what it will be like in the upcoming Monster Hunter Wilds as well. The original Dragon's Dogma first opens up with us playing as Savan, the arisen of his own time period and the man who would eventually fell the dragon and become Seneschal. What the Seneschal is in the setting of Dragon's Dogma isn't important at the moment, but what is important is the contrast between the two games and the way they introduce themselves. Dragon's Dogma threw you into the fray. You go from a tutorial dungeon crawl to a chimera fight, one that you can actually win if you're skillful enough then a time skip of sorts and we're thrown into a battle again, this time against the story's final boss and antagonists, 
the Red Dragon, Grigori. 2 feels like it starts at a slower pace, but it's quick to disprove this notion. It wants you to take more in, but it also wants to add a bit more mystery to everything. We don't start as a character from a past time, we start as our Arisen, locked up in a prison within the borders of Batal. Mistaken as a pawn, we are treated with no respect and seem to be forced into slavery within an excavation site known as the Hole. Yeah, I mentioned this in a previous video, but there is pawn, slavery, and prejudice in the game. This is a quick tutorial section for the player to learn how to pick up and use objects, but it felt a bit out of place to me. They wanted this section to teach you things, but that's all you really learn. And then we're off picking up rocks and dropping them off at the designated location. You do this once, and next thing you know, there's a brand new monster terrorizing the excavation site. You go from carrying boulders to chucking them at a new Medusa archetype, and based on your vocation, you'll pick up a set of beginner weapons. Then you're thrust into battle against your first giant monster. Enemies in Dragon's Dogma come in various shapes and sizes, but the larger creatures often have multiple health bars and weak points to exploit, often requiring you to have to climb your enemies to reach them, one of the key features of the series. One of its biggest appeals is the ability to scale these monsters similar to games like Shadow of the Colossus, changing combat from your traditional hack and slash to a more involved and grand experience. The game makes every battle against a larger creature feel unique and engaging thanks to this. It's not required to climb all over them, but the potential to do so adds to the overall experience, and the game wants you to understand this by throwing you into the fire right away. And how could you resist one of the game's greatest draws? From there, you're close to being left to your own devices. One griffin ride later, and you're in the land of Vermund. If you've played the original game, this will feel familiar to you as it's visually similar to Granzis, although much larger and more detailed. A big complaint with the first game was how the open world felt empty and without life, and I am happy to say that this has been iterated upon and improved in the sequel. The land of Vermund feels rife with life, from enemies to passers-by, and every road you traverse gives reason to stray from the path to find items, chests, and secret locations along the way. Throughout your journey, you are incentivized to explore, to find new locations, even if not related to a quest, because the rewards for doing so are new locations, rare goods, and potentially new quests you never expected to find. And while some of these locations seem to have static placements of enemies, others seem to be dynamic changing what you can run into. At one point, I was traveling to a seaside village to rid it of Saurians, and upon a return visit, I randomly saw a drake in the distance that I had to bypass because I was sure it would kick my teeth in before roasting me like a boar over a campfire. That's something I love about the game. I could be walking down the road at one point, trying to reach a location far from the city, and the next thing I know, I'm blindsided by a minotaur of all things because this dude was legit hiding behind a cliffside, blending into a bunch of oxen, ready to murder my ass. Next thing I know, I'm fighting for my life, but luckily I'm not alone. I have my personal pawn, plus those I hired, and what's more, any individuals on the road will more than likely come to my aid, especially those guarding an ox cart. A battle that I was probably not expected to complete at my level has the potential of victory through skill, teamwork, and sheer force of will. People within the world really do come to your aid whenever possible. Early on, a battle could be decided based on if a group of travelers happens upon your battle while it's happening. This can go both ways, though. I teamed up with individuals to defeat the Minotaur one time, but another I was beating up a griffin until it flew me into a party of gore harpies that began to overpower and take control of the fight, leading to my death. Just think about that for a second. Dragon's Dogma is a game where you can fight a griffin, climb on top of it, be flown across the entire map, and then launched into a bunch of new enemies. What other game provides that for you nowadays? What game provided that for you ever? It's near one of a kind, something you have to experience to believe. Now I mentioned pawns, and for those new to the series, this is another unique feature to the game and one it is best known for. Dragon's Dogma was always meant to be a single player experience. It has been mentioned by Itsuno how this is important to him. I imagine a big factor of that is due to how the pawn system was implemented. You are not truly alone within the world of this game. Every Arisen, aka the main character, who has their heart stolen by the dragon, gets command over all pawns and even gets to make their own. These pawns are NPC party members that you don't control, but do get to command and how you use them slash what tasks you complete with them will change how they behave. Pawns have inclinations to start. It helps set their base personality and it's a choice you make within the character creator. Your main pawn stays by your side during the entirety of the game, but Dragon's Dogma is still a community affair. 
At Rift Stones, you can find and search for additional pawns. Almost all of these pawns are created by real players and uploaded to the game servers. You can use your friends' pawns, random pawns, or anywhere in between. And by using these extra characters and completing quests or fighting enemies, they will learn from you and bring that knowledge back to their world for their arisen. My pawn went on an adventure with someone else and then knew the path to take me through on a particular quest because she had completed it before. Even better, your pawn grows with you in level and vocations. If you have a mage pawn, they will actively grow in their vocation while used and you can then further customize them by unlocking new abilities, augments, etc. Then you rest at an inn, which uploads your pawn's data to the server, and they have been updated for anyone that wishes to hire them. Pawns grow alongside you, and other players can both see and make use of that progress. To not be completely overpowered for newer players, pawns do have some rules. Namely, that they cost an amount of rift crystals to hire if they are a higher level than your arisen currently. Rift crystals can be found throughout the journey, but the main way of earning them is by making your pawn more desirable and worthy of being hired, because through use in other worlds, you will passively earn rift crystal income. That's right, I'm running a pawn side hustle in Dragon's Dogma. For the most part, that's what these crystals are used for, but they can also be used to purchase some unique gear from unique vendors, maybe some items here and there, maybe some dyes. In the original game, what made these pawns desirable was their vocation and usefulness in combat. A healing mage pawn could be very valuable to a lot of players, meaning they could see a lot of use. Now, all mages have default healing abilities, giving them more room for offensive spells, so being a healing mage isn't as great as it used to be. You need to go a bit further in their build and customization, and Dragon's Dogma 2 accounts for that. Not only do we earn levels and learn about quests and monsters, but these pawns also unlock traits through your interactions with NPCs within the world. I earned the ability to see all generic gatherables on the map for my pawn, and later the ability for them to manage my inventory so I didn't have to. Pawns are invaluable to the Arisen, so of course people will want the most useful ones in their party. What makes them useful can be dependent on what you are trying to do at the time, forcing you to change your party structure around every so often to both update the types of vocations you bring along as well as hiring higher level pawns since you will quickly overpower them. Plus, there's another new feature called Pawn Quests, where you can assign a task to another player's Arisen to complete when taking your pawn into their party. Upon completing the task, the Arisen will receive a reward of your choosing from gold out of your own pocket to items you may no longer need or simply want to give. And when you send somebody else's pawn home, you can inform that player that you liked or loved the pawn and offer a gift to be sent over for their hard work. You choose these pawn quest tasks from a list whenever you are in the rift or after resting at an inn and receiving reports of your pawn's experience in other worlds, aka other players' games. The list starts with simple jobs like walking through the world during day and night while the pawn is at your side, but you unlock more as you complete tasks in the game. Hunt a Cyclops, and sure enough you can make killing Cyclops a pawn quest that can be used to help your pawn earn badges, which I believe is another new mechanic in the game. Previously pawns could have three tiers of knowledge when it comes to monsters, I think this could even become mastered or something like that, I haven't played in a minute but this seems to be a more binary affair in the sequel. Instead of the three tiers, you instead need to kill, say, 30 Cyclops, which will unlock a badge for your pawn. Once they have this badge, they are considered an expert in terms of fighting that monster and, I assume, have all knowledge surrounding the creature's strengths and weaknesses. Not a huge fan of that personally, but I don't feel it's as bad as it sounds on paper, as my pawns still seem to actively learn how to use the weaknesses of the Cyclops to her advantage. Maybe it's just a badge of honor. I'll have to explore the feature more to be sure. If that sounds like a grind, there's an upside. Thanks to pawn quests, you don't need to do the grinding. Create a proper reward, assign your pawn the quest, and let the other Arisen do the work for you. It's just basic economics. Combat is as amazing as ever. Dragon's Dogma isn't as combo heavy as a game like Devil May Cry, but the influences are there. Making use of your skills at the right opportunity to make them the most effective is the key to any battle. 
If I want to close the distance on an enemy, I'll blink strike them. If I want to deal heavy damage over time to a large enemy's weak point, I'll grab hold of them and gouge them repeatedly. You get to choose four weapon skills to use at any time, and you can mix and match those with a larger pool of skills you unlock as you advance your location, allowing you to find what works for you or what works in a particular situation. Fighters can guard, so you may choose to use some skills and passives that draw enemy attention, allowing your pawns to be the damage dealers, but you can just as easily be a powerhouse yourself with abilities that can hit a wide group of enemies or even harpies out of the sky. Each enemy that is downed or pressured enough will become susceptible to a finisher move as well, or rather a more powerful move. It's not guaranteed to finish anyone off, but you'll see a small effect when pressuring an enemy that allows you to perform this maneuver for devastating damage. You probably see me doing this all the time here with the fighter vocation. Where combat really shines is against the larger monsters, of course. Ogres, Minotaurs, Cyclops, Griffins, Golems, and more. Each enemy is unique in its own way and requires a different approach to take on. The more your pawns fight them, the more they will know about the enemy, allowing them to be more effective in battle while offering advice. Plus you can high five them. Sometimes an entire town can be your team. I remember walking through Vernworth and randomly seeing an ogre attacking villagers in the city. There's no loading screens between areas and settlements anymore, so everything is open and any creature can appear within the walls of somewhere like the capital, leading to utter chaos. Seriously though, the game just drops you into the action almost immediately. Any trail you traverse or explore past has the opportunity to pit you against small monsters, skeletons, phantoms, bandits, and giant creatures, many of which you may not even be ready for yet. A minotaur can launch you into the air, a griffin can fly you around the map, and a golem can laser beam your ass into oblivion. It's the best. The world is a hostile place, and you need to be ready for that, hence why preparation and planning is so important. Traveling during the day is going to be safer than at night, and combining gatherables into potions can make or break a fight for you. If you're poisoned, you better have an antidote or a pawn that can cure you. Otherwise, you may be shed out of luck in the middle of nowhere with no way of getting back safely. But don't worry, the game isn't unfair. There's means to save yourself here and there. Maybe you can run into an ox cart that can fast travel to wherever it's heading. Just be careful since the cart can get raided along the way and you'll have to fight to save it before continuing on. Or maybe you'll choose to use the new camping mechanic which lets you set up a quick base of operations to cook food in and pass the time, as well as change the skills of your party in case something isn't working for you. It's a new feature that makes traveling these long distances less daunting, and you will be going long, dangerous distances where anything can happen. Making periodic stops along the way to resupply and boost your stats with cooking can make or break your current adventure. And just like the original game, you can find pork crystals along the way, used as a means of setting up a custom fast travel point. To this day, this remains one of my favorite means of giving fast travel meaning within the setting of the game. You can't just go somewhere and teleport there later unless there's a port crystal left over, and you get to be the one that finds and places these crystals, meaning the points of travel are set up on your own interactions in areas you feel they would be most effective. If you're someone tired of how lazy fast travel options have become in modern games, well, let me just say that Dragon's Dogma has the answer for you because every point is both earned and customizable since you can pick a port crystal up after placing it in case you change your mind. This is just the surface of what Dragon's Dogma 2 has to offer. Just a taste of what is waiting for you when you start to play. A taste of perfection that I have been waiting almost 12 years to experience. A game that has the potential to be the greatest of all time for me. Obviously, it isn't without its faults, and I've listed some here, but we will go further in depth in the full review once I've completed the entire game, an experience I plan on showcasing over on Twitch to give me something to do while recording footage and taking notes. Dragon's Dogma 2 is everything I have wanted it to be so far, and I didn't even make it halfway through, at least from what I could tell. There's so much in this game to explore, so much to see and do. Everyone's first playthrough has the potential to be drastically different in comparison to someone else. If you are a fan of the designs of Hidetaka Miyazaki with his philosophy of creating challenges that allow for experiences to be shared between players, let me just say that the entire world and storyline of Dragon's Dogma 2 is an experience you will want to share with your friends, teaching them things and learning things yourself along the way. It's a game that doesn't hold your hand, but if you are willing to be patient and listen, you will quickly adjust and find yourself able to cut off a Saurian's tail when the pawn clearly tells you that that's what is necessary to defeat the enemy effectively.
Everything has a solution, sometimes multiple, and you get the opportunity to figure these solutions out, to use pawns to help yourself learn these solutions, and to teach other players through the pawn mechanic based on your own experience. Dragon's Dogma is a shared world in a single player environment. It's a shared experience for everyone to play as a community, and it's going to be, in my opinion, one of the best gaming experiences of your life. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking, commenting, subscribing, and making use of my personal pawn so I can get those sweet, sweet rift crystals. If you have any questions or get stuck anywhere, feel free to ask me about it in the comments. Additionally, if you want to learn more about the original game, be sure to check out my multi-hour retrospective on Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen, and if you want to watch my playthroughs from start to finish as I figure things out as I go, head over to my Twitch channel. All the links will be in the description. Thanks for watching, everyone. Hey, thanks so much for making it to the end of the video. This is the Patreon section of the video. i um, using my little guy here because I haven't showered yet today and I'm a mess. Patrons will show up here. Uh, they're usually here, right here. And uh, we're gonna go out and shout out the G-Rank patrons for being so cool. Uh, shout out to Gloomerous. Shout out to Jordan Painter. Alid. Omar Parker. Foxy Tron, Brendan Hesse, Wooly, Ralkar, Prime XD, Ashtray, Moal Kasemi, Captain Zeba, Cyberworm, Jonathan, Strangely, Lud Hifumi, Rosalio, and Mr. Janky. Uh, Mr. Janky also proofreads the 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 majority of my script at, scripts at this point. So. Shout out to Mr. Jenky. Thank you guys so much for watching. And uh, thank you guys so much for watching. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye.